soon. So Dr. Zelohowski is sharing her screen so that you can see the wonderful slides that she and her team have developed for this podcast series, which we call Roadmap to Resilience. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit about it and give you some samples because we think this might be something that you'd like to share with colleagues some, or perhaps also with parents, maybe with attorneys or judges. Uh, this is a, a series intended for a wide audience. So let's go through and do a, a, a quick preview of, a, of the podcast series. And Amanda, Dr. Zelohowski and I are the, are the hosts, but we have a number of wonderful presenters. We'll see, we'll see them momentarily. And this, the, this project started really right around the same time that everything changed with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we know that since early 2020, families and children have just been caught up in this truly in, intense storm of stress and challenges. They've been cooped up at home when they've had to quarantine or isolate. Children have not been able to go to school in, in many cases for long periods of time, and they've been separated from their peers and their friends. Parents have had to do double duty, continuing to work when they are working parents and also doing childcare. Uh, it's just been an enormously stressful time. And we know that as a result that this has been, this is hard on kids. And uh, we, we know that we're preaching to the choir here, but this is really a, a, a time where many kids and many families are, are feeling right, really at the end of their rope. And the, the, the threat of potential harm to children has increased because of the isolation that's involved. Uh, we, we don't have as much contact with the families and children that we serve. Um, even though we try our best, but it mostly has to be remote. So this has been a time where it's really especially important to reach out to children and families and to the, the, the mental health, the, the social work, the psych psychiatric counseling, marriage and family therapy, all the professions that work with children and that help children recover from stress and from trauma. So as a result of this need, uh, this actually happened at a time when we were just about ready to start a, a new task force. And that's our next slide. And in early 2020, I had actually been talking with uh, the leaders of a number of organizations from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, um, and the American Psych Psychological Association's Trauma Psychology Division. So those are four organizations that I'm very fortunate to belong to. Um, and the leaders of those organizations recognized that it really was important to bring together members of these four different organizations in order to develop some materials and some resources for children and families and for the adults who serve children and families. So in, in August of 2020 and, and then in September, we actually started a task force. And there were over 25 experts from these different organizations from all over the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, we don't have adequate representation, I have to say, from Europe. And we need to in increase that. But we have representation from almost every other continent. The timeline continues on, and in, in the summer of 2021, after spending a number of months just talking about what, what could we do that has not already been done, what could we do that would actually be value added and not duplicative, we decided that this is a group of, of child trauma experts that, that has so much knowledge and so much experience. And, and by the way, the members of this task force include mental health professionals, social work professionals, nursing, medical, pediatric professionals, attorneys, uh, people who are from really all walks of professional life. And I think very much like the, the member of the Child Protection Hub. So we decided that we ought to tap into the expertise of this group. And Dr. Zelohowski and her team have been doing a, a wonderful podcast series that she can tell you more about called Pandemic Parenting, which is another one that you'll definitely want to check out. When I, when I 
saw that podcast and was fortunate enough to be able to participate in it, I realized this is the sort of thing that we could do with this task force. So we set about interviewing members of the task force and those interviews then have become the podcast series that we are now gonna tell you about. And it took us a while, but last fall, we were able to actually release this podcast series. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about what is it and who are the resources for? Amanda, take it away. Sure, thank you, Julian. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for having us. We're so excited to, to tell you about this resource and it's been great to get to know a bit about Child Hub and, and your respective organizations. So thank you again for joining us. So yeah, what were our goals in putting together this Roadmap to Resilience series? We were really focused on, you know, essentially giving the psychological science away in some way, especially focused on child trauma. So we wanted to make the clinical science about child trauma available and accessible for anyone who needs it. That includes not just professionals, but as you'll see in a bit, um, some focus on, other, you know, on the community, on parents, on policymakers, not just sort of the usual organizations and um, professionals you would imagine are involved with kids who have experienced trauma. So that was a goal was to make this really accessible. But we also wanted to focus a bit on the professionals from a lot of these different disciplines. So uh, as Julian said, mental health professionals, legal professionals, healthcare providers, policymakers, caregivers, we wanted to arm people with resources that they can really trust, that they know is, are coming from child trauma experts in order to find some ways to build resilience following not just you know, the COVID-19 pandemic or some of the sort of civil and racial unrest we've seen throughout the world, uh, the disparities that have emerged, but a lot of the traumatic experiences that children were experiencing before the pandemic and now have only sort of been exacerbated. So our focus was not just on you know, kind of a COVID-19 pandemic aftermath, but really to make sure these resources are helpful and applicable, no matter what the type of trauma is the child might have experienced. So that is our hope that they will be useful long beyond when we are, are out of this uh, current situation. So who are these folks? I'm actually gonna turn this part back over to Julian, if you don't mind, because I'd love for you to tell us about who these people are that you convene together. Well, as you can see, we, we have, you can't tell from the, their names, but we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, we have social workers, we have nursing professionals, we have attorneys, uh, we have policymakers, we have advocates. Uh, and this is a group that comes from all over the, as, as I said, all over the world, many different ethno racial groups represented. Um, some of our experts work specifically with families and children who have immigrated from other parts of the world, generally under very adverse circumstances. Others work with children and families where a child, children have experienced sexual abuse or physical abuse. Still others work with families and children who have experienced uh, traumas that involve accidents, illnesses, disasters in some cases, and even exposure to war. So pretty much the full range. Um, and they represent the organizations that I mentioned. So, so you can see we have, the, we have a remarkable group of people, men and women, who are really dedicated to serving children and families and helping them to recover from trauma. Yeah, so the way this worked was, you know, Julian and I weren't really sure where this was, was going to go or what, how we were gonna organize all this information. What we did recognize was we had this group of, of wonderful, brilliant experts with experience in lots of different areas and really fascinating perspectives to share. And we have some people who've been doing work for many, many years. We also have people very early in their career and that was important to us too. You know, um, Nicola Plena you see there is a, a current graduate student. So we wanted to represent the full range of experience and perspective just coming from a lot of different angles. So what we did was really just sit down with all these people and have a conversation ask them questions, tap into their expertise, ask their perspectives on various you know, ways that they've found to work with kids or problems that are in the system that they've recognized throughout their careers. And we just, we picked their collective brains in the best ways we knew how. And then after we talked to everybody, we tried to pull out, what are the sort of themes that emerged? Okay, a couple people seem to have these ideas, let's say for example, especially on working with kids who have experienced sexual abuse. Some people have really specific thoughts or suggestions around how community can get involved and what advocacy might look like in some of these contexts. So it was really fascinating to kind of take 
all of the data, if you will, and then organize it in, in ways that made sense. And that's how we came up with the, the podcast episodes, which I'm gonna just sort of walk you through how that's all organized now. I mean, again, we wanted to make this accessible and engaging in a platform that people are really used to now. And, and podcast seems to be a way that folks are accessing information when it's convenient, you know, while you're out going for a walk, while you're doing chores, washing dishes at home, you know, while you're at work, people are using them in professional settings and trainings. And so it seemed that this would be the easiest way to kind of organize this information and store it, archive it, you know, for the long term so people can access it whenever they want. So Roadmap to Resilience is a podcast you'll find on all of these different podcast players you see there on the screen. Everything we're gonna talk about now and walk you through, you can access on the website, which is roadmaptoresilience.org. So I encourage you while you're listening to us right now to pull up that website, kind of, you know, just play around, peruse through it while we're talking about these things so that you can kind of find, you know, the things that we're pointing you to. You can ask questions, that, you know, at the end about things that you can't find or you're wondering maybe how to access them. So we'll, we'll be walking you through parts of it, but know that everything we talk about, you can always find, start with the website if you're having trouble finding in other places. So, and again, when you go to the podcast, you'll see that there are 17 episodes. So I just wanna talk you through how those are organized and sort of clustered, and then how you might be able to use them in your context. So we first tried to focus on some foundational concepts, right? Recognizing that people might, find their way to this audio series having no experience with trauma or maybe being a parent or a caregiver and just sort of wondering, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about what my child just went through or what to do all the way up through the spectrum of really experienced professionals. We wanted to sort of level that playing field and make sure people are familiar with some of these really important core concepts when talking about children who experience stress and trauma. So there's a sort of introductory trailer you'll find. There's an episode focused on, you know, what is trauma, what we mean by that. Similarly, the concept of resilience, right? Which is a, a very complicated term used in lots of different ways. So we had we really enjoyed hearing the opinions of some of our guest experts on their thoughts about what resilience is and how we use that term. Then we have an episode on ways to prevent trauma and then one focused specifically on the concept of dissociation. So what I'm gonna do with each of these clusters as we talk you through them is show you an example because one of the other resources in addition to the podcast episodes will be these sort of bite-sized video clips that are kind of quick, maybe one to three minutes or so, answers to specific questions or explanations by some of the experts, again, in these really small digestible ways. So from this particular introductory cluster, here is a clip of Dr. Joanna Silberg talking about what is dissociation. So sort of teaching people what she means by that. Well, what the word actually means is disconnection. So what we're seeing is that children who are experiencing something traumatic may need to disconnect themselves from the reality of their experiences. And the way they disconnect themselves can vary, and it can become increasingly more sophisticated to the point where even when they're teens or even young children can actually develop separate senses of self so that they feel like they're not even in an experience. For example, let's say there's a girl going back and forth between a mom and a dad, and there's a divorce situation. And in one house, things are one way, and in one house, things are another way. Even a normal child who has not experienced severe trauma knows how to adjust themselves to have a different kind of a way of speaking or personality or way of talking that's appropriate for each environment. But imagine if the environments are so dramatically different that you need a whole different self to cope. Like one environment is traumatic and abusive and one is kind and nurturing. And it doesn't have to be obviously in separated families such a thing could be occurring even within one home where there could be times when things are calm and needs are met and other times when things are not. So because of that, the child has to adapt themselves to extremely differing circumstances. And there's a disconnection between the selves as they are adapting to these separate ways of being. So the reason it's a really handy little trick is Kids have to survive no matter what. They need that connection, attachment to someone. And if the only way they can do it is by cutting off a little piece of themselves so that they 
you don't remember bad things when they're experiencing good things, then that's going to be helpful. So that's an example of, of how we might break down a concept in that cluster. Go ahead, Julian. Great. Isn't that a great example? That's one of the best definitions of dissociation I've heard and so few technical terms. That's but again, right. not dumbed down. This is, I think it's still entirely accurate for those of us who want to take a professional approach to understanding dissociation and how kids experience dissociation when they've experienced trauma. And yet it's also so, so clear for, for any, any parent, any adult, is trying to figure out why why does my child or why does my student just seem to space out or just seems like she's not there or, or he just seems like he's a completely different kid sometimes that's a, a great way to begin to help that that adult parent teacher whomever it may be to just step back and understand oh maybe this is something that this child has needed to do in order to be able to cope with some fairly drastic circumstances, especially if there's trauma involved. That's right, yeah. And it was one of my favorite things about these conversations is just these different perspectives. You know, like many of you, maybe, I, I was always sort of taught in my training, you know, dissociation is automatically a bad thing and we have to make it go away. And, you know, all these sorts of negative connotations. And, and the way that Dr. Silberg lays it out is as this sort of survival tool for some kids and are there ways for us to better understand the utility of that uh, in a child's life. And so it's just really refreshing to get these different perspectives and ways to think about some of these concepts. So the second cluster of episodes, uh, episodes six through nine, really focus on specific contexts. So there's an episode on children who've been sexually abused, children who have experienced uh, the loss of a parent to intimate partner homicide, uh, working with trauma in cross-cultural and immigration contexts, and then specifically focusing on global and collective traumas, including the COVID-19 pandemic, but not only focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we just thought that, that some of our experts had such great things to share about some of these very specific contexts that could be helpful, again, sort of globally. That was why we wanted to organize some of them around these specific contexts. So again, I'll give you another example here. Um, this is one of those sort of bite-sized clips from another of our experts, Dr. Viola von Eden, focused on children who may not disclose sexual abuse and some of the reasons for that. One of the things that's really hard for people to understand is why children don't tell, why they don't disclose right away. And I think that it's important for them to understand that for younger children, oftentimes they don't really realize that they are experiencing sexual abuse. Um, they may think that it's a game. They may think it's something special between them and the perpetrator. For older children, there's a level of shame and oftentimes that's used to make them think that they are the ones that are gonna get in trouble. I've also had many children over the years tell me that you know, my mom or my dad said, if anyone ever touched me, um, they were going to kill them. Um, I don't want my mom or dad to go to jail. So I think there's a whole host of reasons that may be counterintuitive to the average person. Um, the frustration that children don't just run and immediately say, um, someone touched me. It is something that I hear quite often, but helping parents, helping uh, lay people to understand that there's a broad range of dynamics when it comes to child sexual abuse. So oftentimes I'll hear, oh, but they're, you know, they're getting straight A's at school. So there's no way they could be experiencing any trauma or no way they could have experienced any abuse. But what I'll say is that for them, for that particular child, school is a place that they feel confident. School is a place they feel comfortable. So that child who may very well be a victim of child sexual abuse is very much engaged in their activities at school and their grades because it's a way that makes them feel, feel confident and feel strong. Other children may have their sports activities. I think it's more about understanding a baseline of what your child is like and what may have changed. Is there something that may seem or appear out of the ordinary? Are they more quiet? Are they quieter than usual? Are they withdrawn? Or are they, you know, a little more hyperactive or something than they usually are? So it's knowing your child and kind of knowing that baseline 
and then recognizing that overall, yes, children can be extremely resilient. So there's another really important connection, I think, being made by Dr. Vaughn Eden with coping with the effects of trauma like abuse and resilience. And that's part of the message I think that is really crucial in, in all of these podcasts. And that is that while resilience is a wonderful thing and we always want to support that, it often comes at a cost. And sometimes that cost is keeping a secret that is a very painful secret and that can lead to, to further victimization. Other times that cost is excelling, but needing to keep some feelings and thoughts just under wraps and the, the pressure that that can put on a, on a child as they grow into adolescence and then adulthood. And we know that resilience often comes at a very, very significant physical cost because very often resilient individuals who've experienced trauma have bodily conditions. They sometimes age more rapidly, the telomere shortening phenomenon that's been identified. So resilience is a, a thing that we want to always encourage, but with recognition that it, come, it can come at a cost unless we're aware of what it takes for children to be resilient when they've experienced trauma. That's right, yeah, thank you for that. Yep, so the last cluster of episodes focuses now on, on all of you. And, and that was sort of our goal next is to really zoom in on specific audiences, people working in different contexts. So if you sort of take a look at the rest of the episodes, they're very targeted to certain groups. So there's an episode for mental health providers, one for healthcare providers, uh, for lawyers in the legal system, one focused on parents, communities, policymakers and systems leaders. Uh, there's also one focused on clinical training programs, and, and that was when, you know, Julian and I are both in, in roles where we are mentoring and supervising and training a lot of students and colleagues, and so this was just such a, a wonderful experience for us to get to focus on that piece, too, because we often go right to thinking about the providers, but not necessarily how we change systems, how we train those coming up under us in ways that is going are going to foster their resilience, right? Rather than kind of lead to things like burnout in the field. And so uh, it was important to us to focus a lot on, on training as well and how our training systems can foster more resilience. And then the very last episode there is maybe my favorite. It's focused mm -hmm. on, on how the helpers can help themselves on this notion of, of what self-care looks like for those of us who work in these spaces that are very difficult and complex and can lead to things like uh, burnout, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, lots of these concepts we tried to focus a bit on in, in that episode and really asking all of these experts, how do you take care of yourself? What does that look like for you? Um, to just give people really a, a range of, of experiences. And I'll show you an example in just a second from one of these, but just wonder, Julian, if you wanted to add to some of these target audience episodes. Oh, great summary, Amanda. And that th this is the, the the range that we're trying to cover. So that we hope that for every one of you, at least one and maybe several of these podcasts will be extremely relevant, and for your colleagues in your in your field. But for all of us, regardless of our specific profession or specific focus and work, that final episode on self care is going to be highly relevant. And I can assure you that when you listen to that, you will not hear the, the usual obvious common sense advice that you just need to eat well, exercise, get enough <laughs> sleep. Those are things that we certainly endorse. But what you'll hear is a, a much more nuanced examination of what it takes to actually do this work and to care for ourselves in ways that are not just the, the obvious common sense ways of a healthy lifestyle. We build on a healthy lifestyle, but we go well beyond that. That's right, yes. So we're gonna give you now an example from one of the episodes, which is the one focused on parents, episode 14. And here is a clip from that episode from Dr. Archana Basu. So I think as parents, one of the most instinctive things is we are pretty attuned to what our kids need. We recognize subtle shifts and changes. And I think that is incredibly valuable. 
And the parenting sort of relationship or the caregiving relationship is also an incredibly powerful motivator. We might not be great at self-care for ourselves, but we're great about making changes often in the service of our kids. And so I think seeking support, maybe sometimes that's a check-in with the pediatrician. You know, should I even be worried about this new behavior or this change that I noticed in my child? So I think the one thing parents are great at, they know their kids best. And for me, fundamentally, when I work with children and families, I start with the premise that parents are the experts on their kids. They know their kids really, really well. And the first step is to understand the child and the parents and their parenting philosophy in collaborating with them. I think we all recognize that, you know, we were not meant to parent in isolation. <laughs> it has never been the case in any society. And this is a unique challenge of the pandemic. And even as things shift and change, we're still struggling with a lot of this. So I guess the last thing I would say is, we know this as parents and caregivers, that we need support networks. Um, children need parents, but they also need other caregivers. And I think building and rebuilding that village in any way we can is something that we're used to doing and, and or, you know, know the importance of and can get help in doing. Um, so I think these are some of the things that come pretty naturally to parents that we can build on. So for a lot of you who work with parents, I, as Julie mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to let you know just about another free resource that is out there, which is the um, Digital Resource Hub and nonprofit organization I co-founded with Dr. Lindsay Malloy, who is from Ontario Tech University. So our focus there at Pandemic Parenting is, is very similar to what we are doing here with Roadmap to Resilience, essentially to just pull together the psychological science in ways that are really accessible for parents in real time, you know, credible information about how the pandemic is impacting you know, your, yourself as a parent, your kids. So just wanted to let you know about this free resource as well. You can find everything. You see the, the social media channels there, but it's pandemic-parent.org. And you'll find lots of, of resources there focused specifically on parents, bringing in experts in very similar ways as to how our pandemic parenting team helped to produce this Roadmap to Resilience series. And even though Anything, that's a yeah, wonderful resource for parents in the pandemic, and we hope as the pandemic hopefully recedes, but it really, as Amanda said earlier, it, even though it's called pandemic parenting, it really is parenting from many different perspectives and such a wonderful array of different ways of thinking about parenting, of approaching parenting, and in a time where parents are under a lot of stress. Even when there's not a pandemic, as you said earlier, Amanda, parenting is never free from stress. No, exactly. When the yes, additional, right impact and and i know i see from a number of the attendees at, at our webinar work with parents and families who have been through massive stressors refugees immigrants people who have have parented under extremely dangerous and, and threatening conditions so pandemic parenting does not have answers for every parent about everything but it has a lot of wonderful insights that i think parents will find very helpful Thank you. Yeah, there's a whole section on the site focused on trauma and crisis and resilience. So I encourage you to, to check that out for those of you who are parents or work with parents. Um, and a, a special plug for Julian's podcast episode, which was called Trauma-Informed Parenting. So it's especially focused on, on how parents can support their kids through these types of experiences. So yeah, so check that out. And thank you, Julian, for your kind words. Anything else you want to say about the podcast episodes before I shift into some let's, of the other resources? Let's move on to those other resources. All right. So in addition to the podcast episodes, you'll find a whole sort of library of infographics. So we tried to take some of the best uh, tips, information, you know, resources from each of the experts and turn them into infographics. So you see three examples here. One infographic focused on dissociation, one on supporting children who experience sexual abuse, one on fostering resilience, especially in under-resourced families and communities. So lots of different perspectives there. Those are just three of them. You can download any of them, share them, use them in your own networks, trainings with families, you know, whatever ways might be helpful. And here is a list of all of the infographics. I know that is, is small font, but you can find all of these again on, on the website. Um, when you are just sort of poking around, I wanted you to see kind of what is, is there. So there's 15 of them that you'll find, I think lots of, packed with lots of great information. 
So then the other resource are these quick, you know, FAQ video clips. So I'm just going to show you a quick animation of the website. This is what it looks like right when you go there and where to find these video clips on our YouTube channel. So I'll, I'll talk you through this sort of animation now. So if you scroll down on the website, you'll go to this section right here that says watch highlights from the interviews. You'll click on view all, and that's going to take you to our YouTube channel which has over 40 of these bite-sized expert clips. I've shared with you, you know, three of them already. So you could just kind of get a little flavor, but you'll just see tons of them there focused on lots of different things for different audiences. And again, we encourage you to share these links, use them in your own sort of training, staff meetings, conversations with families to say, hey, this is that question you were asking me, you know, here's a, a quick tip from an expert on some ways we might think about that in, in our organization. All right, so infographics, bite-sized video clips. Now we just wanna talk you through a little bit about how else to use these resources. We've given some of these suggestions. So you can listen to all the podcast episodes in order, which we definitely recommend. Or if you're pressed for time, you know, focus right in on those that are specific to your context, to the types of kids or families that you work with, to the types of um, professional setting that you are working in or, or your networks share those with others. So maybe you work with some legal professionals, send them the link for the episode focused on the legal system. You know, maybe you work with community organizers or advocates, send them that episode, point them, you know, in the direction of these resources and say, hey, listen to this. I just listened to this episode. I'd love for us to sort of chat about, you know, what we each think, how this might be applicable in our context. So definitely share all of these resources or specific ones with others, I, I think anytime any of us receive a specific recommendation from somebody we trust or really respect, you know, we're more likely to take that to heart and say, oh, wow, this would be great. Thank you for sharing this and, and let's talk about it after I have a chance to listen to it. You can incorporate any of these videos or infographics or podcast episodes, as I said, and into your own resources, brochures, your teaching, your, your workshops, whatever ways might be helpful. P feel free to link to anything on your own organizations websites, put them in your newsletters, share things on social media. All of this is, is publicly available and meant for you to use in these ways. So please don't worry about asking us permission, just use them. Um, we'd love to share them as far and wide as we can because we were so grateful to have these experts so generously share their wisdom with us that we want to make sure as many people access them and, and find them helpful as we can. And then I guess the last thing I would say there is just if there's any way we might be able to collaborate with you to get these resources translated into your languages or languages of your organizations or, you know, families that you work with, please let us know. Um, right now, they're only available in English. We are in the process of translating some of them into Spanish. We would love to make them as accessible to anyone as we can. So if you you know, have any ideas for how your organization or you personally might be able to work with us to get some of these things translated. We are open to that and would love to hear from you. Julian, you want to add anything to right. that? Great, great summary. And if, if collaboration is something that would help you advance the work that you're doing with the communities and the children and the families you're, you're serving, please reach out to us. We, this is a project that actually, it was started through this task force. And then because it, there was some costs, uh, but we were able to do this incredibly economically. And we had the support of a center that I've been fortunate to direct. It's part of what's called the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is a network of centers that serve communities um, and professionals throughout the United States. I wish it was international, but it's funded by our federal government. Um, and this network in, has a number of centers that focus on special issues. Our center in particular is called the Center for the Treatment of Developmental Trauma Disorders. So we realized that at this point in time when there is so much happening in the world, not just in our country, but in the world around racial justice, around pandemic and crises, war, violence, and just the, the threats that children and families live with because of violence in, in the home that sometimes is, is not discovered for long periods of time. We realized that these are the kind of resources that just need to be widely available. So we were very fortunate to be able to draw on some of the funding from our center, which is funded by the United States government. And as a result, everything that we produced, as Amanda said, is completely free and completely open to being used in any ways that you find helpful uh, and that can be helpful to children and families. Excellent, thank you. 
So we will leave you in, in this sort of segment with one final video and, and sort of call to action, maybe a takeaway for you from another of our experts, Dr. Michael Salter. Genuine interest is just a wonderful way of describing, I think, how adults should relate to children generally is genuine interest. And it's kind of, it, it's, it's an open-ended curiosity at its highest form sort of expresses itself as a kind of a wonder at the child. And that's a place, it's a relational space in which all sorts of things can start to manifest and what's interesting about kids, particularly when it comes to what we call disclosure, when they're starting to talk about things that they find difficult to talk about, is just how carefully they test the waters. You know, sometimes not even the flicker of an eye, you won't know what they're trying to initiate, the process that they're trying to initiate. But kids don't tell you things that they don't think you can handle. And the nice thing about genuine interest is that it creates a milieu in which the child feels confident that you can handle what they want to talk about. You know, that what they've got to say is not going to be quickly shut down with, you know, too much concern, too much kind of judgment or shame or, or so on. So, you know, I think genuine interest is a very nice way of describing how a protective family operates, how a protective school operates, how a protective service operates, um, which is always just that openness to the child's sort of inner world, however that world is going to unfold for us. And the back so in, story, yeah, mm -hmm. the back story for, that, for that brief moment of, of insight was the discussion that Amanda and I were having with Dr. Salter about what, what does it mean to take a, an evidence-based approach to providing treatment or recovery oriented services for children and families who have experienced trauma. And rather than talking about the specific techniques or technologies as, as important as they can be, it, we came around to the, this one phrase that Dr. Salter just used, this genuine interest. And I think that that captures really the, the theme and the tenor of of this entire podcast series, because really what, what you'll find in the podcasts are a number of people who are genuinely interested in children and not just in an abstract sense of, oh, you know, I care about children or I wanna be good to children. Yes, there's that, but much more in the sense of truly wanting to find ways to help children to express whatever they feel safe enough and feel that we can handle so that they can then come out of the, the, the position of not being able to disclose or not knowing how to get help or not knowing if there is anything that or anyone who will help them. So genuine interest actually became our way of, of summarizing how best to approach from all professions and all walks of life the recovery process and, and helping children to build resilience that doesn't have a cost, but that is actually something that helps them to have a healthy and successful life and not be burdened, even when they have experienced the, the, the incredible challenge of trauma. Yeah, the other phrase in that clip that has stayed with me so much since we had this conversation with Dr. Salter is that children only tell us what they think we can handle, which I think goes back to underscoring the importance, of course, of, of self-care and building our own resilience as professionals working in these spaces or you know, caregivers supporting children who are have experienced really difficult things. And so how important it is to attend to our own sort of training, self-care and, and resilience so that kids believe that we can handle what it is they need to tell us. So to that end, we want to thank you for your genuine interest uh, and everything that you're all doing to support children who have experienced stress and trauma. And we'll sort of end there and, and address any questions. And again, we just really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Exactly. Thank you so much, Amanda and Julian. It was for the really interesting presentation as such, a, I would say inspiring and useful tool that you shared uh, with us today. Um, this, last, uh, this last video clip was really inspiring, I would say about this genuine interest for the children. And I would say it's really interesting, it caught my ear how it connected with the uh, uh, to be concerned, to be concerned for, for what a child experiences because I, I imagine it can be overwhelmed 
for the child. So it's it, it's really important all the time to those our emotions when we are in the contact with, with the child and really to train ourselves and to be in contact with our emotion and our experiences. So thank you very much. I would say that is um, through the whole presentation, it, it was uh, also connected uh, with the role of the professionals and the parents to handle themselves also while uh, being in contact uh, with the child. Um, so um, there is a possibility to ask the questions and to share the comments. Uh, I wrote it also in the chat. So if you have any questions and comments, feel, uh, please feel free to write it. I have just one question. Uh, is it um, this work also in progress? Should we expect more videos and more materials on the, um, on the tool? Or this is like the wrap up, uh, everything's already uh, on your uh, web page. Yeah, I, I think we've meant to package it okay. as a sort of, you know, ready to go. Here's everything for you. So, you know, at, at this point, we, we don't have plans to expand beyond these initial conversations. So everything is that's there. coming is there. Ne never say never, I guess, right? Um, <laughs> but but we, we tried to design the materials in a way that they would be, you know, very sort of long lasting and applicable uh, in the long term. So, yes. but of course, if you have ideas, Please no, let us know. We're so always much. open to it's hearing just them. An yeah. Idea is it going to be uh, against sure. some other add-on that you're planning? But I, I think uh, right. as I heard you, and I went through uh, the web page as you, you were talking dur during this webinar. It sounds really fantastic and really pointed out. Um, and there is a question: very interesting materials. Thanks for this. Uh, will these materials be placed in the Child Hub Academy? Thank you much, very much for your question. Um, I will definitely. Uh, uh, debate this uh, with our child hub, uh, child hub staff. I will share uh, this webinar and this tool, and we will see how we can promote it more uh, through the child hub to be really um, to, to be at hand to all the professionals who are connected with the child hub. Thank you uh, for this question, and also from Yelena, she said thank you for the great resources. So I think that people are really happy with it. And also congr congratulations for all your work. Thank you for the information. I'll be happy to use it in my future project. Wonderful. Please yes. do. Great. Thank you. And, it, and we do, we do yeah. hope that you will feel free to share this and the, the link to the podcast and the infographics, the, those bite size, uh, brief but very informative messages that you can you can access. Think about the thing you can do to repay us for this presentation is by thinking of ways in which you can share these with your colleagues, with the families and children that you serve. And again, we realize that in some cases you're working with children and families where they're not really in a position to be watching or listening to a podcast uh, at this particular time, but you might take just a small part of that. And maybe that could be the beginning of a conversation with a, a child or a family when you're, you're trying to talk about or you want to talk about something that's really difficult, but you don't want to make it a, a pressured situation. Um, these podcasts really can become openers for conversation. They can really open the door that I think of Dr. Silberg's from the very first the one that we showed you, just to think about, you know, I wonder, I wonder if, if, if this might be something that your child talking with a parent might be experiencing, because I've noticed that sometimes it seems as though he just seems to kind of be off in a different world. Maybe that's not such a terrible thing, and maybe we need to think about whether that might be a way in which dissociation is helping him to cope with some of the challenges that he's experienced in his life. And that could then begin the conversation. And a parent might say, oh no, that's not true. <laughs> that's, not, that's not my son. And I, I don't want, I, you know, don't label him or us as dissociative or us as bad parents because of what we're doing. So you can see that these are, these are podcasts that for, for parents and children, they'll often really require some very sensitive introduction and some kind of careful guidance and, and navigation so that they don't think that the message is that there's something wrong with them or their child, but rather that there are ways of understanding how their child or they as parents have adapted to trauma mm. and ways in which we can help 
as professionals, but they can also help if they understand that those adaptations are part of being resilient. They're not a part of being in, in any way ill or deficient or defective. They really are ways in which people adapt, children and parents adapt to the challenges that trauma face or trauma bring to their, their lives. Thank you, Julian, very much for your notes uh, and uh, ideas you shared with us, especially with using the postcards in um, when working with parents and the child. Um, and also there is from areas, uh, I will share this link with my child protection network here in Philippines. I, I think it's wonderful. Uh -huh. So it, this, it, it's, I find it really, really useful and very user-friendly and very um, aimed for the professionals and, par and uh, as well as parents. So thank you very much again for sharing uh, this with us today. So um, if there is no questions, I would just like to ask uh, Amanda or you, Julian, do you want uh, to share any final uh, sentence, any final note for our participants? Amanda? I, I, yeah, I would just say, you know, thank you again for having us and, and just for your own resilience and doing this really important work. Um, it's become so much harder for all of us the last two years and with so many more layers added to work that was already difficult. So I guess, yeah, my, mine would just be to take gentle care of yourself because we really need you out there. And so, um, yeah, and thanks again for having us. Thank you. And all I would add is that if you check out these podcasts, what you'll hear are people who are experts, but they're just ordinary people. They're just like the rest of us. And they're, they are deeply, deeply involved in, in the work as I know each of you is. And it's that involvement and that sense, you know, when, when Amanda and I did, the, and we, we did all of these interviews. So we got to have the, the experience of learning from each one of these experts firsthand. Yes. Uh, and as I did each of the interviews, what I thought was, not only am I learning so much, but I'm getting a sense of a, of a community. And again, it's not that I don't have good colleagues and good friends and family, but to have the, these experts as, as a kind of an extended family and a community, that's, that's the way that I felt once we had concluded all the interviews. And I hope as you listen to some of the podcasts, maybe all of them, you'll see that there, this really is an opportunity to get to know some people who are doing work that's similar to yours. Um, and if, if we ever have a chance, we will definitely do more interviews and we would love to do them with some of the, the folks like you because the, there are so many experts out there that we couldn't tap into. And we know that you know things that we've missed on the podcast. If you, if you see that and you think of that, send us, send us a message, let us know. If there's things that we haven't covered that you think we should, that would be really great. We can't promise that we'll do another series, but we'll certainly try. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, especially for both of you from this motivational work and um, and uh, for really inspiring. Uh, I would say it's, it was a really inspiring presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, two final notes for, for, from me is uh, for the participants, if you want to receive a certificate of attending the webinar from the Child Hub, you can write it in the email of the Child Hub. I will write you in the chat. So just send it to the Child Hub and you will receive a certificate uh, to your email. And like always, there is a very short evaluation poll uh, in the end of our webinars. Uh, so please feel free to click it uh, and to give us a few uh, more seconds uh, of your time. Like always, please stay in touch uh, with the Child Hub uh, newsletters and our Child Hub platform. Uh, we have also a few interesting webinars uh, until this end of the February, so it will be great uh, to have you uh, with us and also to share any ideas or any need uh, for the webinar or any kind of uh, e-course on the Child Hub. We are very open and very happy to re receive the feedback from you. Um, thank you, Amanda, again. Thank you, Julian. And we'll definitely stay in touch and we really hope to promote more of this fantastic tool uh, through the Child Hub and maybe who knows who to cooperate more uh, in the future. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes.
Thank you, Vesna. Thank you. Uh, it's so wonderful to be able to get to know Child Hub and so many of your members. Thank you. I wish you a really Thank nice you. rest of the day and to you uh, who, is, uh, who are with us uh, in the morning and to all the, of our participants who are here and who are finishing and wrap, wrapping up uh, their professional day. So have a nice rest of the day. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Goodbye you. to Bye. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.